What is up, my math friends? Alan here, pushing the limits one more time with section 2.3 titled Limit Laws. So as you can see on this one, we're going to have basically a lot of definitions that I'm going to throw at you. Not too many as far as an explanation goes because there are so many. Uh, so if there's any that you want to go over in more depth, please look those up, meet with me, uh, ask for a supplemental video, be happy to do that. Otherwise, let's go for the first two here that should look familiar, but wanted to give you a better idea of why they are what they are, rather than using that numerical way where we plugged in things from both sides of these limits. So uh, 231 A and B, I'm calling it because they're very similar, very close. Uh, remember the limit is of some function. That is our y value, that's our f of x. So if we were to think of this graphically, which we said last section is one of the easiest and quickest ways for us to evaluate a limit by seeing what it's approaching on both sides of that a value. Let's start with the first one here. If our function y equals or f of x equals x, what does that look like graphically? Well, that would be the line y equals x, or for every x, we get that y value out, whether they're positive or negative values. So if you notice, no matter what we choose x to be or approach, as x approaches any value, what are we going to get out for the y on both sides? Let's just pick an example of negative 2. If I said we're going to approach negative 2 for our x, what would we be approaching from both sides for our y value? Well, hopefully you can see that that is also negative 2. So the answer to this one is simply a. x is approaching a and y is equal to x. Well, then since our x is approaching a, then so is our y value. That would be what the limit is for that one. Now go ahead and explore the next one if you haven't done that already. Again, please go through the whole thing, try to fill in as much as you can, and then watch the video and go over it. What if it was y equals c? Well, remember, c is some constant value. Pick a number, any number. You said three. I'm just kidding. I don't know if you guys actually chose that, but let's just say that this is a value of three. So this is saying that y is equal to three where? Well, everywhere. And that would be the graph of this line, y equals three. That means x can be anything, but no matter what, our y is going to be that three or whatever constant it is. And so to find the limit as x approaches anything, whether it's two, three, four, zero, negative three, negative four, you can see from both sides of every one of those values and anything in between would be approaching the same y value of three. So no matter what we choose here, the constant will stay that constant. All right, so these are things that we already discussed last section, but wanted to give you a little reasoning as to why they are what they are. And those are definitions or theorems. So that is something that we can just use from here on out and not have to think about, explore, graph, any of that. You see this, you put that. So as I mentioned, there are a lot of definitions. We're going to go over what are called the limit laws as we have some function approaching some number. It exists and it is that value we'll call L. And then let's say we had some other function approaching some value. Let's say that they're the same for two different functions and that therefore yields two different values, the limit of L and the limit of N. Go through and see how much of this that you can fill in just by reasoning through it. What would you want it to be? Think about that. And again, let's look at the first one here and just kind of talk it through. What if I had the limit of f of x plus g of x? Do you want to sit there and add those functions and then 
approach that value of A for every X and see what the Y values actually come out when added together? Or what would you rather do? Go ahead and try those and see what you come up with for both adding, subtracting, call it the sum and difference law. What happens when we multiply one of the functions, pick one, I just chose the first one, F, by some constant and multiplied it by that? Or what if they're multiplying the two functions? We call it the product, dividing, quotient, to a power. Or if we had a root or radical on just an X or an entire function, see what you can fill out. I'll give you all of these. We'll talk about it. We'll then therefore use them and continue to move on, pushing these limits and trying to get a better understanding of them. So I know that was a lot, and this is a lot to throw at you. So let's just talk through all of these now that we have them written down, hoping that you know what we would like to happen is basically distributing this limit to these things or applying the limit of each individually since we're going to have to add the insides and then take the limit as x approaches a what we can actually do is take the limit of each and then add them and since we said the limit of f of x as x approached a was l then we can replace all of this with just l and because we said the limit of g of x as x approached that same value a was m, then we can say that this whole thing is m. All right, so to simplify a limit where you have functions that are added, whether they're two separate functions or just a polynomial that is broken up by plus or minus signs, you can actually split up all of those individual pieces and evaluate each one onto itself, which is easier typically to find the limits of than the entire adding and subtracting of the polynomial. Same as if we were to multiply by a constant, whether it's inside or we can take it outside and evaluate. Because the limit as x approaches a is only going to affect the x's. So that constant that we're multiplying by, whether we apply the limit or do it to the inside is going to end up still being that multiple of that constant. So just C times whatever the limit of our function is, All right? So you kind of get the picture here. I won't walk you through every single one of these, but whether you're multiplying, you can also split those individually. Dividing, you can split those individually or even raising it to a power. You can take the inside of that as the limit and then raise that whole thing or answer to the power. That includes fractional powers, which if we had one over n, that is the same as this. So these power radical root laws are basically the same thing, whether it's just an x inside, or the entire function. Okay, so these are the laws that we can now apply and use without having to do all of the separation. I'm fine with you guys skipping this and taking these and going to this. All right, but that's gonna take some practice. It's gonna be required of you to make sure that you look at these. And I did leave one blank here. Remember, there is one stipulation when dividing that we cannot do, and that is we can't have the denominator be zero because that is undefined. That's where we get those vertical asymptotes for our y values. With practice, these will be easier. And again, I know it seems like a lot, right? We got quite a few rules over here. Could have coupled a few of these together, right? But wanted to make sure that you can see each and individually and then apply them accordingly. There is some good news. We can basically generalize all of the stuff that we just went over, all of those laws, by simply using a thing called, which takes us to our next definition. Whether you have some polynomial, p of x or q of x, and we are taking the limit 
as our x approaches a, what does that mean that we would be able to do for that entire polynomial where we're adding, subtracting, say we had x squared plus 3x minus 5. Remember, we said that we could take the limit of each of those individually, where that's a constant, that's a line, and that's a parabola. Well, we know that we can just plug in using this direct substitution to find P of A. For all those X's that are approaching A polynomials, you can just plug in. And why can we do that with polynomials? Why is that the key here? If you remember the shape of polynomials, we got this one, the quadratic. We got a cubic. We have quartic. Whether they're up, down, left, right, a different form, they're all smooth. There's no breaks, holes, jumps, vertical asymptotes, and that's key. But what about when we have a fraction where there's polynomials on top and polynomials on bottom? Well, there can be issues. As long as we don't have that zero in the denominator, then it also holds true. So we can write that as P of A over Q of A. So we call that number C a, a root solution, x-intercept or zero of our polynomial if the polynomial that we're given, P of X we're calling it, when we plug in that constant, some number, whole number, positive, negative, fraction, what would it have to be equal to? You should know by now that would be setting our polynomial equal to zero, which is where our y values would cross through our x-intercept, which is also called a root or solution. So any of these terms, if you are asked to find that, you simply just set it equal to zero and find that value or values. So we've talked about that before, just trying to reiterate that point because it's something not only that we've done in the past quite frequently, we will continue to do that throughout this course. But we did mention that if we have the denominator, we called it Q equaling zero, what would be the issue? Well, as we mentioned, there's no way that we can solve or provide a value when we have a denominator of a fraction that is zero. So even though that could be a technique, what does that end up leaving us with? Remember, we discussed this last section. It's called, and that means that sometimes we're going to have limits that we are unable to determine a value because we do end up with zeros in the denominator every once in a while. And those we call an indeterminate limit, right? Because we can't determine what the solution is by using that direct substitution. But of course, that doesn't mean that the limit doesn't exist. It just means we're not able to use that quick way of either the limit laws or direct substitution to get to the solution. How then would we figure that out? We can't just say, well, it's indeterminate and I'm not going to determine it. So we're gonna be a little bit more determined than that. We still wanna find it. And you remember we talked about the three techniques in order to find limits were numerically, that plugging and chugging technique where we chose some numbers on both sides of our X and approached it closer and closer to see what our Y's were approaching. Hopefully the same number, because then that was our limit. It exists and we gave them provided that value. Graphically, we said, well, that's super nice because we can just literally look at it and whatever X they tell us to approach from both sides or one or the other, Remember on the right, it was the plus following the value. The left was the negative finding the value. But otherwise, it was both sides. We could just view and select the correct answer. But remember, we mentioned a third way that we would use eventually. And that's for things like this. And that was algebraically. Because we don't want to have to graph rational functions if we don't have to. We don't want to have to do a bunch of plugging and chugging for values 
that aren't going to be very nice to work with in the first place. So what do we mean by algebraically? Well, there's a few techniques that we're going to use that I mentioned at the very, very beginning of this class are some of the most important things in all of mathematics. And that first one is multiplying by a fancy one. Because ones can look very different, right? We can have just this, we can have this, or we can have this. All of these are ones. And if we take anything and multiply it by a one, we will get the same result, whether that is that form or even this. It will still simplify to be our original thing that we started with. Right? And there's one that we are going to use by multiplying by these ones more frequent than others. And that, my friends, is called the conjugate. Hopefully you remember what the conjugate is. That was when if we had, say, A plus B, we would take and multiply that by A minus B. The only thing that changed, which is why we give it a special name, is the sign in between the two things. All right, the second technique that we will use frequently is factoring and or, these kind of go hand in hand, simplifying. All right, so these are some techniques that we will use algebraically, we're calling it, by multiplying by that fancy one, oftentimes a thing called the conjugate, and or factoring and simplifying. Right, so these will be important for us to get the hang of. And of course, at the end of this, we will do some work on it. Um, stuff that you've done before, but of course, with limits. That's the calculus portion. You've done things like this throughout your years of algebra concepts. So the last thing in this section is something called the squeeze theorem. And yes, it is named very aptly because. That's exactly what we are going to do. Sometimes there's a function that is just too nasty to work with. So what we can do is take that unfortunate function and squeeze it between two that we do know. Squeeze mean that one is a little bit less than the function and one is a little bit bigger than the function. As long as we're approaching that same value, if we can prove that f of x and h of x are equivalent to some value, again, since we're finding limits, we'll just call it capital L for that number. Well, then if we know that this is in between those and these two values, for their limit as x approaches some number, any number, is the same, then what does that mean that the g of x, the other difficult challenging function, its limit as x approaches a would also have to be? You got it, that same value. So we're squeezing it between two things and we will, check this out a little bit further down the road, but for now I just wanted to introduce it along with all those other limit laws. And now we just have to apply and practice until we master. So until the next one, keep working hard, almost through these limits. We got two more sections. I'll see you in the next one. Squeeze it easy.